Um, so I am Pippin, and I make, I make video games. That's kind of that's that's what I do. Uh, and what I am wanting to talk about uh, this evening is the idea of having less gameplay uh, in games. Not because I don't like gameplay or you know I think we should have no gameplay in any games, but as a kind of a direction uh, that some of us uh, could move in uh, as a way of making more interesting things or differently interesting things. Uh, so less gameplay is kind of the, the theme here. I actually, I gave a version of this talk a couple of weeks ago at the Global Game Jam in Malta uh, under the title of Minimal Game Design, uh, whatever that is, I had to work it out. Uh, the title was given to me. Uh, and basically the idea was to talk about, you know, how can we make games in this very short period of time that are still kind of whole uh, and interesting in themselves. And my big solution was like, try to have as little gameplay as possible in your game, because that's the thing that will ultimately defeat you. Uh, so I'm sort of extending on that, because I thought it was more interesting than, um, than I'd initially imagined. I'm going to present using a text file, so this is the, the latest weird um, presentation method for you. So sometimes the pop-up menu will come up and will become part of the discussion. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about the last um, five games that I've released, all of which are kind of minimal gameplay, uh, less gameplay games, and all of which um, it focus on using the idea of having less gameplay to do something else. So it's not that they have less gameplay because I'm lazy or I don't know how to make games, which is like sort of true, um, but because I think that you can do interesting things without gameplay or with as little as possible. Uh, so I've got the Abramovich Method games. Uh, these were a collaboration uh, with Marina Abramovich, as Lorenzo just said. Get X Avoid Y, Manifest, Sound System 1, and Let's Play, Let's Play, Ancient Greek Punishment, Art Edition Edition, uh, which is the last one that I'll talk about. So let's get going. So the Abramovich Method games. Uh, so the emphasis uh, in these games is less gameplay, more awareness, uh, more awareness of time in particular, time and physical, your physical uh, body and your mental state. And these games came about from this collaboration uh, with Maria Abramovich. If you haven't heard of her, she's a performance artist, um, and she is known for doing these very, very intense performances. Uh, often they last for days, um, days and days. Uh, one of her famous performances was to sit in a chair uh, opposite people for uh, every working day uh, for, I think, three months or something like that. That was, that was the artwork. So you know, whether or not you think that that's a good artwork, um, and we can discuss that later, um, it's very, very impressive just from an endurance standpoint. And one of the things that Marina does uh, to prepare for these performances, here's a little picture, um, is she does these Abramovich method exercises. And this is Marina doing some, one of these exercises with Lady Gaga, who uh, was into it, uh, I think, last year sometime. I don't actually know what they're doing, but it's, um, it's intense. Um, and these exercises, they're all about kind of preparing yourself uh, mentally and physically to do these very extreme performances that, uh, that Marina does. And she's got a whole suite of them, and part of our collaboration was me turning those, uh, those exercises into digital games. Um, and so I wanted to show you one of them, because they all have this, this basic commonality of really not having very much in the way of gameplay. Ignore this game that's coming up later. This game is called Complaining to a Tree. So this is one of the exercises uh, that Marina does. There's often a sort of time minimum involved in these things, because you have to spend a while with them uh, for them to kind of work. And in Complaining to a Tree, uh, the idea is that you, uh, let me just make this window very slightly larger. You choose a tree, obviously, that you like. Um, go out into the forest, look around, find a tree that is, you feel sort of compatible with in some way. Uh, so there's a menu system in the game that lets you choose a tree. I quite like this tree, um, so I'm going to use this one. Um, and you approach the tree, you stand near to the tree. There is the tree. Um, and then the dialog box uh, comes up, as you can see. And in the real exercise, what you do is you now start complaining to the tree about like your life uh, or you know, whatever you want to say to the tree. You say to the tree, and so in the game, uh, you do the same thing. So I might say, Hi, tree. Uh, I'm feeling quite nervous right now. And I'm giving a talk. And then I hit enter uh, and save to the tree. And then the dialogue comes, comes back because the tree has accepted you know, the thing that I said to it and it's listened to me and I've been heard. Uh, and the tree doesn't talk back or judge me, <coughs> which is great. Um, 
And that's, that's the whole game, everybody. So less gameplay, right? So there's a dialogue box. Anyway, see you later. Three. Uh, and you can talk to the stream through the dialogue box. And it, it plays on this idea that we have about user interface design, uh, that when we have a dialogue box and we type some text into it and press return and it disappears, you know, that means that it has been transmitted somewhere. Um, and in this case, it's been transmitted to the stream that we're talking to. So it's got very, very little in the way of gameplay. And the idea is instead to evoke um, the player's chance to think about their life, think about how they're feeling, think about you know, things that they want to get off their chest, um, and it provides this, this treat that you can say those things to. Um, so in this instance, um, we have less gameplay, and instead we can use that as a kind of a way to emphasize the way that we feel, uh, to be more aware uh, of, of what's going on. Uh, this next game is called Get X, Avoid Y, uh, and this game was about de-emphasizing gameplay uh, in order to look at art. And by art, in this particular instance, I mean uh, graphics, basically. Maybe I should, I'll change that to graphics. Graphics. Um, makes more sense. Um, and the reason for this, uh, this game being made was that I was uh, thinking about that claim that you sometimes hear from the formalists, the terrible formalists, uh, who often talk about games as if they're made up out of their rules. And in digital games, that's often seen as their code, uh, but the rules is really even the greatest, you know, the most supreme thing. The game designer carries the rules down on the tablets from the mountain and shows them to everybody else, and everybody else does stuff that supports the rules. Um, and we see this kind of um, emphasized in a game like The Marriage, for example. Um, by Juan Humble. It's a, a game about marriage, and it's very, very abstract. And the idea is that rules all on their own can support meaning, and you, know, you can have this whole game about marriage uh, only supported by rules. And I kind of wanted to go the other way, and to look at what if you just have almost no rules and you want to change a game according only to uh, its graphical representation. Um, so that leads to this game, um, Get X and Y. Uh, very, very simple game, as you can probably already see. I'll play it. I'll get the X's. Getting those X's. X, X, X. Getting a bunch of X's and doing quite well. Um, I got seven X's at height. Uh, so I'm trying to get the X's and I'm trying to avoid uh, the Y's, right? Um, and if that was all that I had done, I would be okay with you kind of booing me at this point, but it gets more interesting uh, than that. Uh, the thing that I was interested in is if we change the way that this looks, we don't change the rules, if all the rules stay the same, click one kind of thing, don't click the other kind of thing, um, would it be the same game? Um, could we really say it's the same thing? Um, so let's look at another one. It's going to randomly generate um, another level now, so I don't actually know what's going to happen. Um, so we'll see what it gives me. Okay, it's not my favorite one, but um, this one, we've changed the X's are now white chess pieces, uh, and the Y's are now black chess pieces, and we're on a checkerboard. So the white background has been exchanged for a checkerboard. And if I run it, it's sort of a similar game, uh, but it's changed a bit, right, because of the relationship uh, between the white pieces especially and the background. It's, quite a lot harder to see the white pieces because when they pass through uh, white squares they become invisible. And that's not a property of the rules of the game, that's a property of the visual representation of the game, right? So we only changed the pictures, but the game uh, was cognitively more challenging. Um, you can also do kind of visualization things. Uh, if you make a very long and thin graphic, you get kind of visual effects that you might not expect. So you get something like this. Uh, so again, it's quite different. It's visually, uh, it's a lot harder to click on things because they're moving in this sort of unpredictable way. I only got two that time. Um, and so you can do uh, visual representation. Uh, you can perform the stroop test on people just by changing the graphics. Uh, you can get them to try and click on the words that are the wrong color uh, for what the word is. So they're trying to click on yellow, but that's that's correct. It's blue, black's black, red's right, so not, things like that. So again, we can use kind of semantics as a way of changing things. I kind of wish we could bring up something more interesting, but it's not going to. Um, these are not my favorite levels. Um, you can do all sorts of things, is the basic thing. We've got these basic underlying rules, uh, things move around on the screen and you click them, and depending on what graphics uh, you insert into that, you can change meanings, uh, you can change kind of aesthetics, you can change cognitive load of the player, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, so in this case, you know, the artist is making the design decisions, in fact, uh, and kind of you know coming out on top and determining exactly how the game plays out in different iterations. Uh, so that's uh, a case of emphasizing uh, less gameplay, not no gameplay, but almost no gameplay, and seeing what you can do with just the, uh, the visual representation of your game. 
Another thing that we can do for the writers, uh, you know, the all-powerful writers, is we can emphasize the fiction over the top of, uh, of gameplay. Uh, so, uh, in this case I was making a game about something called The Secret. I don't know if anybody knows what The Secret is. Um, it's this really ridiculous idea. Um, sold a lot of books. Um, Oprah was very, was very into The Secret. Um, and so, th this is kind of the summary of what The Secret is right here. Ask, believe, receive. Uh, and so the premise of the secret is that you really want something, you really want a Ferrari, uh, for example. Everybody wants a Ferrari. And what you do is that you just want it really hard, really hard, and you make collages of Ferraris and put them up in your bedroom, and you just really, you really want it, and then you believe that the universe is going to give you a Ferrari. Um, and that's, you know, that's all fine. Um, but the secret is that that's going to happen in that case, because the universe wants you to have a Ferrari. Um, and so that's the secret, it's stupid. Uh, there's a kind of parallel uh, in some Christian, uh, I hesitate to call it theology, but the prosperity gospel. Same, same kind of thing, except it's God instead of the universe who gives you the Ferrari. And so you ask God, God sees that you're a good person, and God gives you a Ferrari, because that's how it works. So I wanted to make a game kind of about that, uh, and working on a kind of a fictional version of the secret. Um, and to have a game, in this case, with no gameplay, Convey this, to convey this idea. Uh, so this is Manifest, um, and it basically purports to be a training application uh, that will help you to do all of this amazing magical stuff uh, that you might want to do to get a Ferrari. And it's all premised, uh, as you can see here, on this kind of narrative about a Russian cosmonaut uh, called Romanov, of course, um, and he goes up on the MIR space station and he's flying around in particular kinds of rockets, and one day he sees these mysterious patterns uh, etched onto the wings of his plane or something, and he realizes that if he visualizes these patterns, um, then he's going to be able to have anything he wants. Um, because you know, at some point you have to break down and do the stupid thing uh, that the secret requires. So it's all kind of based around this fictional idea to make it sort of vaguely convincing that you could have an application uh, to train you. And so here's the training screen. Uh, you can choose which things uh, you want to have. There's not actually a Ferrari option, which is probably an, an oversight. Um, but it's, for instance, everybody wants love, right? So what you would do is you choose this love desire on. This thing is called a desire on. Uh, and you, everybody can do this with me, actually, so we can all have love in our lives. Uh, just picture this, this thing here, this love thing. Think about it and fix that in your mind because this is how it works. Uh, so think very hard about it. And, well, think very hard about it in just a moment. I'm going to push the button and start thinking now. So everybody thinks about love. Put your fingers on your temples if you want to. I find it helps. Uh, we're trying to resolve these random dots to bring up that image of love. Starting to resolve. It's looking pretty good, actually. That's not bad. Uh, almost there, that last piece. So we've got a 72% match. So, you know, we can get better than that. We can keep training, right? But it's better than chance, at the very least. Uh, and so this, this is how this game works. It's no gameplay, right? It's psychic gameplay, if you like. Uh, you play the game by imagining things in your head and believing that you can possibly affect what a computer is going to bring up on the screen. Uh, and so the point here is that maybe a computer is a good example of how this is uh, perhaps a foolish belief. Um, because we mostly don't believe that we can just kind of mentally make things happen on our computers. And so maybe it helps us to see uh, that the secret uh, is not such a great idea. Uh, so that one, less game than more fiction. Like playing around with fiction, uh, you often don't even need gameplay because you're setting so much context um, that you can uh, that you can actually get away with nothing. Uh, another thing I've gotten interested in this year is music. I, I don't really know very much about music, but I really wanted to do something with music. And I was reading uh, a lot about avant-garde um, art movements, and in particular, I read about the composer John Cage. Um, and so I ended up making a game about music with some very little gameplay. Uh, John Cage, uh, for those of you who, who don't know who he is, famously composed this piece of music, uh, this blank, blank piece of music, uh, called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. Uh, and what it is, is it, it's a, a composition with no, uh, no music for that amount of time. Uh, in the most famous um, performances of it, the pianist uh, you know, comes in very important, sits down. Uh, at the start of the piece, they raise uh, the cover of the piano, uh, and then they don't play anything uh, for four minutes and 33 seconds. And then at the end, they close the piano to show that it's finished. Uh, so, kind of high comedy in some ways, and like, oh, uh, it's rubbish and ridiculous uh, in some ways. 
Uh, but the point that Cage had was that the sounds that you could hear in the concert hall or wherever you were hearing the performance, they were the music that was actually playing uh, while you were listening to this silent piano. Uh, and he was very interested in kind of natural composition, this idea of composition uh, that would spring out of nature. Um, another thing that he did a lot was that he uh, composed through chance operations. Uh, so he would flip coins, for example, to decide what note to play next, or he would consult the I Ching, uh, which is a mystical textbook, to decide you know, what instrument he was going to use next. Uh, so he was really trying to erase himself uh, from the process of composition. And I found that kind of alluring and interesting, so I wanted to see if I could make a, make a game that would kind of do that sort of thing. Uh, and that is this game here. Uh, so I'll let it start playing now. So it plays music on its own from the beginning, uh, because two of them are kind of time sensitive. So uh, number two and number four are playing uh, notes based on where they are on the screen. Uh, so one of the two of them pulse uh, according to a frequency based on their spatial position, and four is just like a traditional uh, tone matrix with uh, x being the time. Um, but these other ones here respond to physics. So there's physics, you can grab these circles and move them around. And when that dot hits, uh, turn it up a little bit. When the dot hits a ball, it plays a tone associated with that ball, right? So we're using physics, which is like maybe the most natural uh, thing that we have in computer games, you know, it's modeling a physical system that exists in the world. And uh, we're using that as our composition tool. Get some drums. There we go. So when they hit each other, they make their various uh, drumming sounds.
I felt like, kind of disturbed actually by this whole this whole experience. It was really really weird uh, to see these games that I made, uh, often as sort of jokes or meditations on something, turned into these very static um, objects on walls, even if they were art. Um, and so I kind of wanted to steal them back. Uh, so I made a game sort of about that. Uh, so I'll bring that up here. Uh, so this is Let's Play, Let's Play Ancient Greek Punishment Edition Edition. So you can see that it is, oh, yeah, it's quite a piercing sound that the eagle makes. The eagle is coming down to pet Prometheus's liver out, if you don't uh, already know this uh, particular Greek myth. Um, he's doomed, he's chained to the rock, um, the eagle's going to pet his liver out. I'll, uh, I'll turn off the sound of the eagle because it's super annoying after a while. Um, and as you can see, it's now it's being re-represented inside the frame uh, of that picture uh, that was in Brisbane. So we kind of have this version of the game that exists inside the artwork. But the thing that turned out to be super, super important uh, to me, uh, which you can kind of see right now, is this reflection in the glass, right? So that's my face. Hi. So I'm reflected in the glass of the painting, and that turned out to be like the most important thing about this game is this reflection. And the reflection is, of course, generated uh, just with code. So I can look down like a god into Prometheus's uh, world and watch him suffer and maybe help him out sometimes. Uh, so if we go over to the code for the game briefly, this is the code for the game. It's not very impressive. Uh, don't read it too closely. Uh, the thing that I spent almost all of my time on, because the game is obviously very, very simple. It's, again, not very much gameplay. Uh, most of the time I spent on this stuff here, uh, this, all of these options for creating the reflection. Um, because you have to have all of these fallback options. Um, some, some desktop browsers support the webcam, and some don't, and some people decide not to turn the webcam on because they think that I'm going to watch them for the rest of their lives. Uh, and some mobile devices obviously don't, don't support webcams. Um, so then you have to have a fallback to a movie, uh, but then lots of mobile devices didn't support the movie that I made of me looking out at the painting and kind of blinking scarily at the player. Uh, so I had to have like a fallback to an animated GIF in the end as well. So there was all of this code involved. Um, I also had to end up changing uh, the webcam plugin uh, that I was using because it didn't handle Firefox properly. And so there was all of this weird, like, if, you, if you're a programmer, you know all of this aggravating work just trying to like, get something to work. And yet it was all in the service of this really important um, aesthetic effect that I was interested in. It was really the core of the game uh, to me. So sometimes the code really takes the forefront in, in what you're doing. So less gameplay, more code, perhaps. Uh, so in all of these examples, the point that I'm trying to make is that you can really de-emphasize gameplay. Gameplay doesn't have to be the important thing about your game. You don't have to start with gameplay, most importantly. You don't have to do that. Um, and if you do de-emphasize gameplay, you leave room for other things um, that you might not have brought in otherwise. You might think about your game a bit differently. You might think about your game a bit more before you even bring in the gameplay, um, so that you can actually have much more diverse ideas potentially when you're not trying to cram them into, it's a platformer, now how can we make this platformer about the atomic bomb or something like that. You can kind of go the other way. I want to make a game about the atomic bomb. Like, what can I do? What kinds of gameplay can I use in that instance? Uh, very importantly, I think that it frees you up to take ideas from much further afield than you might otherwise if you're thinking about uh, traditional game design tropes. Uh, so you can think about avant-garde composition or philosophical ideas about you know, art and what is art in games uh, or, uh, or anything else um, that you might want to do because you're not kind of tied down by the kinds of things uh, that games can do. You might have no gameplay, you might make a game about a stupid uh, cult idea uh, with no gameplay, just like a game. Uh, the most important thing, though, uh, I think, is that if you de-emphasize gameplay as this kind of core thing, the designer as this kind of mythical figure at the center of everything, I think it leaves room for a lot more people uh, to make games and to make interesting games, um, because they can, they can think about the things that they are good at. Uh, you know, a musician uh, can make a game that doesn't have much gameplay, but it has a lot of musical uh, qualities. An artist can make a game that's very beautiful, but doesn't necessarily have to have complex systems uh, lying underneath that beauty. A writer can make a game that's focused on their prose, uh, and not on the kinds of skill-based challenges that make it a proper game. Uh, so I think less gameplay, more people, is really the most important thing uh, about this. Uh, but just in general, uh, when you're making your next game, maybe just try having less gameplay and see what happens. Uh, and that's, that's what I have to say. Thanks.